happy Monday, and welcome back to the Lord and Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery. And what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery? Or do they? Today's episode is called Taking a Life. On January 9th, 2008, the rain had finally tapered off at the Brazzy Golf Club in Chesterton, Indiana. The employees could now go out and look around the grounds for lost balls or misplaced flags. As they neared an area of the course near the Prairie Doonlin Trail, a walking and bike trail that had been converted from an abandoned railroad, they saw something unusual. In the brush, 28 feet from the base of an electrical tower, was the body of a young woman. She wore brown pants, a black fleece jacket, shoes, and gloves. The police were called, and some of the officers had a strange feeling about the scene. They felt as though they were possibly dealing with a staged crime scene. No clues, including any identification, were found. Her autopsy would show that she had been on the course anywhere from 24 to 36 hours before she was found. The woman had sustained a lot of trauma, including blunt force trauma to the chest and abdomen. These types of injuries are usually caused when a person is hit by a vehicle, a person has undergone severe physical violence, or if a person has fallen from a substantial height. Pending toxicology analysis, the final determination of death was put on hold. When investigators expanded their search around the golf course and trail, they found that about a half a mile from the body was a maroon 1997 Oldsmobile sitting in the trail parking lot. When the Michigan license plate on the car was checked, it came back to a young woman named Rylan Cotter. Detective Lieutenant David Sinkowski of Chesterton Police made his way to the family home in Okemos and showed her mother, Nancy, a picture of the body. Nancy verified that investigators had indeed found her daughter. 20-year-old Rylan was born in Mason, Michigan in 1987. Her mother was an art teacher, and Rylan had interests in the arts as well, performing in school plays and the high school band. Friends and family say that she had a smile and sense of humor that made everybody's day better. Her humor and compassion shine brightly, but not as bright as her unselfish nature. A friend said, Rylan always talked about making the world a better place. And after high school, she planned to do just that. She decided to study international relations with a focus on African politics at James Madison College at Michigan State University. In 2009, she was set to travel to South Africa to intern at the Mandela Peace Center. Unfortunately, those plans never came to fruition. As the investigation continued, the circumstances surrounding Ryland's death became more and more suspicious. When her friends and family members were asked what she was doing in Indiana, no one had an answer. Shortly before her death, Ryland had talked about driving to Chicago to pick up a friend, and her roommates became concerned when she didn't return from winter break for classes that started on January 7th. The last contact they had with Ryland was on Christmas Day. Rylan was a reflective person who liked to drive, park, and write in her journal to clear her head. Everyone agreed that Chesterton, Indiana, which is about 50 miles southeast of Chicago, was much farther than she would have traveled to do just that. It was theorized that perhaps she met someone online and had driven out to meet them. No connection to the Indiana town or any friend in Chicago were ever identified. Tips were called in by the public, but unfortunately, other than sightings of Rylan on her drive, none gave them any additional answers. It was found that instead of starting classes the morning of the 7th, she left at 2 a.m. and drove to Benton Harbor, Michigan, where she rented a motel room at 3.30 a.m. She stayed there until 11.30 a.m. before checking out. She was next sighted at 4.30 p.m. in Chesterton at the Prairie Dunlin Trails parking lot, a man walking his dog on the trail stated that he saw Rylan alone in the parking lot before leaving her car and going for a walk. She returned to her car where she sat until he left. At the end of a two-month investigation, 400 hours of video footage from businesses had been checked and at no time was Rylan seen with anyone. Her toxicology report finally came back. 
and it only showed that she had non-lethal doses of over-the-counter medications in her system. On March 7th, Porter County Coroner Victoria Deppi ruled that Rylan had died by taking her own life when she climbed and jumped from the electrical tower she was found at. Deppi told reporters, We've painstakingly looked at all the evidence, and what we've come up with is Rylan did jump. According to friends and family, Rylan had never spoke of ending her life, and no odd behavior was noticed by anyone. Her mother doesn't believe that Rylan died by her own hand, and she has many questions. She believes that Rylan traveled to Chesterton to help someone, as that was her nature. She pointed out that it made no sense for her daughter to have picked the tower that she did, and she also has several scenarios in consideration where foul play might be involved. If this was a case of foul play, vital evidence may have been washed away during the rains. Nancy also pointed out that Ryland had never displayed signs of depression. However, investigators say Ryland had purchased a sleep aid and box cutters in Chesterton. She was also found with a shallow cut on one of her wrists. A year after her daughter's death, Nancy was still searching for answers when she found some support from Porter County Commissioner John Evans. He had served as coroner years before and claimed that Deppie's ruling should have been marked undetermined because foul play could not be completely ruled out. He believes that Rylan could have been chased up the tower and accidentally fell off. Evans said, quote, This death, an error has been made, and it needs to be corrected. Nancy says she just wants to have the case re-examined. I don't know what the answer is, she said. I just know where the problems lie. Officially, this might be a case cracked. But I can tell you, many mysteries of this nature leave us all with deep unanswered questions, unresolvable feelings for the friends and the loved ones, and in some cases, little hope that we'll ever uncover the full truth. But sometimes... A little hope is all we need to keep going. I would like to thank RecordEagle.com, GoShenNews.com, Newspapers.com, StateNews.com, TrueCrimeDiary.com, and NWITimes.com. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is now to discuss it with us. Christy, I've seen many examples where less than stellar investigations leave families with many unanswered questions just like the case that we're, we're talking about here today mm -hmm. and i almost wish that cases of this nature would have death investigations that were just as detailed and methodical as obvious murder scenes which i think is what the families are expecting as well and in many of these cases it just doesn't quite happen that way now admittedly you know, hearing that they looked over 400 hours of footage just trying to to see if she was spotted with anyone else sounds like a pretty solid effort. For me, I'm always caught up on like the the, the uh, kind of more physical information from the scene. And, you know, knowing that there was rain going on, I think it's a good point that evidence could be potentially washed away in that. Was there yeah. any information found to show that Ryland might have been dealing with something that her family just didn't know about? Oh, yes. I mean, first of all, she's starting a new semester of school. That stresses anybody out. Now, her roommate and friend, Jessica Hummel, says that Rylan had been spending more time by herself alone in her room. She could tell that she was going through something, but she says she firmly believes that if it was anything this severe, Rylan would have talked to somebody. Ultimately, she doesn't believe Rylan took her own life. And she actually said, I feel like the cops just want to get an answer because they weren't finding anything. So it sounds like she, she is noticing an action that someone would look at and say possible depression kicking in. Like She's withdrawing in the house a little bit, spending a little more time in her room. And then to your point, yeah, a new semester of school, starting up all these big plans for the future. Like sometimes that pressure can just get to people in, in very different ways. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's what's tough about cases of this nature, though. I mean, you wind up with this question of if she did end her own life, there there wouldn't really be a whole lot else to find at the scene, which is kind of what winds up happening. But 
that doesn't rule out the possibility that someone else wasn't a part of it. Well, and that's the same stance that Commissioner John Evans took. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think he's making a good point. There could have been mm-hmm. some type of chase or some type of escalation going on around that. It's interesting that we have a witness kind of in the area, but that's back where her car's parked. We're talking half mile away. So, you know, maybe maybe it's a 10, maybe if she's walking slow, a 15 minute walk to where this tower is. Or does something happen in the park? Does she flee from there? And that's how she gets to the tower. You've still got this kind of unaccountable time that yeah. is is a mystery. It's just, um, speaking of Commissioner John Evans, <clears throat> I kind of looked into him and the coroner a little bit, and it looks like there is no love lost between the two of them. They seem <laughs> super competitive with each other. Uh, I think she came in right after him and in her first year of being in there, she found out that he had some paperwork at home or something. And she just went after him publicly and was like, all that stuff needs to be returned to the coroner's office. He was saying, no, this is like work files. Like this is, you know, my work, like my analysis based off the files. She was saying, nope, that's, that's not just work product. It needs to be returned to the official files. Ultimately she did win, but it just shows like between these two, politics yeah. animosity of course politics and animosity does very little to help families that are facing tough situations like this but no it really doesn't yeah. and you know her family just wants rylan remembered in death as she was in life she was filled with compassion and had an unselfish nature you don't see, get to see that very often yeah i know in her eulogy they said She placed herself second in favor of caring for everyone around her. And for this, her family finds consolation in the passage. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Yep. Well, uh, of course, I think it would be irresponsible of us to not talk about an episode like this without sharing this information. If you or someone you know is in crisis, you can now just call 988 for help here in the U.S., The previous number, 1-800-273-8255, that'll also still work and continue to function forever. But uh, now we've got this great little three-digit code, just 988, that'll get you some help right away. Christy, thank you so much for all your hard work on today's episode. We really appreciate you. I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Amanda Beard and Carolyn Schmidt. For over six years, we've always run limited commercial ads here on YouTube, and we can't do that without support. If you'd like to help, please visit lordandarts.com. There, you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like HCC recently did. We know that learning about the mechanisms that help support and find justice in these cases is important to understand the many unsolved cases we also cover, and we really appreciate your support in allowing us to continue doing that. Remember, you can get another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. A new episode is coming tomorrow and every Tuesday after that. Visit SeriouslyMysterious.com and subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon below if you want to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. And of course, I'll be back with a new Unsolved Mystery for you on Friday right here on the Lord and Arts channel.